Hello, welcome to Nothing But Net, our program that explores the global internet. My name is Rich Wiggins, and as always, I'd like to introduce my partner in crime, Chuck Severance. Thanks, Rich. Well, one of the things that we do on the show is we have authors send us autographed copies of the book, and we've got one. Of what book? Well, of their book, of the book that they wrote to, uh, to we us. We do have one. We so have, what's up on this one? We have a book by Randy J. Hendricks on intranets, What's the Bottom Line, published okay. by Sun Press. And let me read to you what he has to say. Okay. Rich and Chuck, you two are bringing to television exactly what we need. Nothing But Net is a great program that tells the community exactly what they need to know about the Internet without all the hype, the overexploded vocabulary, and the lofty possibilities. You are a breath of realistic air. I hope I've accomplished the same thing you have, just getting to the bottom line of what an Internet is all about. Cordially, Randy. I can almost guarantee that he hasn't seen our show at all. Well, I can guarantee he gets a place of honor on the bookshelf. Well, of course he does. That's all he has to do is send a book to get that. <laughs> Don't diss the book's display. No, that was a wonderful Thank you, book. Randy. He's we a great writer. Randy. He's a great writer with that. Awesome thing. book. Okay. Well said, Randy. Well said. So what else do you got? What are you? Oh, wait, no, I got something. I've got something. Well, here's a little box I brought with me. Uh, one of the things that I am is the sort of curator of the MSU Computer Science Department Ad Hoc Museum. And so I sort of collect gadgets. Maybe it's because I'm getting old that I'm sort of getting more interested in history. I'm actually most interested in the things like when computing first started. But uh, this is uh, one of the things from my collection. And what this is, can you guess? That looks like one of those ancient Contel bus interface units we had back in the 80s. Well, bus interface units is one word you could use for it. I'll use a cable modem. That's a different word. You mean word. it's like this? It is sort of like that only it's about this this is a piece of equipment we were deploying at MSU in 1985 and it was a cable modem that we used in, at MSU in 1985 and it has the same sort of coax connector on the back of it that the cable modems have today and it has some data connections okay? yeah this was in the days that personal computers were just getting started and you know Zenith 8088s and those kinds of things and these would do 49600 baud connections serial connections serial connections and it went across the cable. It did it two megabits per second for the entire campus. But it was much better than 1,200 baud modems, which is what we had at the time. And, and of actually, course, we, we might mention that a campus like ours might have cable running throughout the entire campus for things like television, right. um, for building temperature control. And so it was real easy to build a data network on top of that if you had a device like that. Right. And so we had uh, quite a few of these at Michigan State University in the late 80s. And of course, we replaced them with higher speed cable modems, much more similar to the cable modems now that people are seeing in their homes. And what companies like Media One are doing with this kind of technology is extending that out through a metropolitan area. Right. Only you have 10 megabit going into Ethernet. Instead of 2 megabit for a whole campus. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty neat stuff. So what else did you bring us? Well, Chuck, I want to um, bring back an old story that you may remember. Okay. Um, I used to write a lot, of, a lot of articles for a magazine called Internet World. That's You reported earlier on a different show that uh, they're out of business, right? Internet World has changed from a monthly to a weekly. They're oh, okay. a different kind of magazine. Okay. And in the best and worst of the net, 1996, in January 1997, they asked me to write just casually and informally what are my favorite things that have happened in the year. What power? What power to so, sort of just decree the best and worst of the net? One of the things that I casually mentioned was I thought the Northwest Airlines website was really good, and I picked that as my choice for the best airline website. Well, I made a little mistake back then, which is I didn't actually try to buy a ticket. And it turned out that at the time, you couldn't buy a ticket. Right. And I was a little embarrassed by that. The article comes out, and sure enough, there's a picture of a Northwest jet is what they feature in the article. But I got beyond that. It wasn't that big a deal. Ever since then, though, Northwest has been bragging in all of their literature that they were voted by Internet World as the best airline website. Well, it was one vote. And every time I fly, I pick, I, you know, I, <laughs> that's right, I was One the to nothing, right? Right. I pick up their in-flight magazine and they have some sort of an ad about the website and they go voted the best airline website by Internet World magazine. Well the reason why the I'm bringing... The power, the awesome power you The reason wield. why I'm bringing all this up is okay. this is a personal message to the president of Northwest Airlines, Mr. Dosberg. I'm going to mail you a copy You're of the tape of the show. You're going to be losing frequent flyer miles, pal. I won't tell him my frequent flyer number. Okay. And my name is Charles Severance. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> And what I want you to know is that it's been a long time since that article was written. The Northwest website has been completely transformed. A lot of it is now done by Microsoft. 
and I don't know whether it's better or not, but all of the industry has completely changed. Everybody's website is completely different. So what I said back in January of 1997 is no longer true, and this is a personal plea to you, Mr. President. Please stop saying that you were voted the best airline website. The, be the best airline website by magazine that no longer exists in the form in which it was... <laughs> and it wasn't a vote, it was one person, so okay. there's my well. little plea. I'm glad we're going to set the record straight. I mean, if we do nothing else, we can solve this one grievous, grievous error. Truth okay. is what we're all about here on Truth, <laughs> American Way, dot, 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 <laughs> dot, dot, dot. Well, now that that's solved, we're going to come back and do Internet for Everyone. In our Internet for Everyone segment tonight, Rich is going to tell us about source code. Rich? Yes, well, we'll get into what the heck source code really is. There was a big announcement recently where Netscape has announced that they're going to release the source code for the Netscape Navigator. Some people are afraid that they may be giving away the crown jewels. So let's examine that issue. What does giving away the source code mean in terms of the user population, those folks who use Netscape Navigator, for the company itself, and for the computer industry at large. Well, what the heck is source code? It's the original programming code for a particular software product. Anyone who's ever taken a programming class has had to deal in source code. Now, old folks like Chuck and myself may have grown up on languages like Pascal or perhaps Fortran. These days, people write in computer languages such as C++, Java, Visual Basic, and other languages. Why would customers want source code to something like Netscape Navigator? Well, most programs are delivered in a compiled or object or binary form. And what that means is that the customers cannot readily modify the behavior of the program. They can have some effect over how the program behaves by manipulating configuration files, plugins, or in some cases using an application's programming interface. But in many ways, their ability to make the program do exactly what they want it to do in certain circumstances is quite limited. Well, why has Netscape decided to give away the source code? First off, Microsoft Internet Explorer is a free product. And it's going to be very hard for Netscape to ever compete with a free product on price. Furthermore, Microsoft has a lot of money. They have a huge development budget. And Netscape, being a much smaller company, can probably never match the development efforts of Microsoft. And another reason is, in a sense, Netscape is sort of creating a virtual development group. There may be hundreds of companies and perhaps many thousands of individual programmers who will contribute little bits and pieces, or perhaps in big ways, improvements to the Netscape Navigator. Well, the question arises, can this ever work? Can a product really evolve and thrive if the source code for that is freely available? The answer is yes. We have a very good example. There's an operating system called Linux that's available for Intel PCs. And this was, was conceived by a gentleman named Linus Torvalds. And it was implemented first by him, but then he made it freely available. And what sprung up was a worldwide community of folks who helped contribute to the operating system. The way this all works is Linux is distributed for free on the internet. Anyone can get the entire Linux base of code and they can do one of two things. They can install it on a PC and use it as is, or they can go anywhere within the, the Linux operating system and make changes to the operating system itself. Now we find thousands of production web servers worldwide are relying on the Linux operating system. Well, how is Netscape going to make money if they're probably not going to make that much money directly on the Netscape Navigator? Server software and other software products is one way that they could still make money. They can make money by selling support for free software, including the Netscape Navigator. Now, support might mean documentation, telephone support, corporate-wide support, the kinds of things that you need to really make a product a part of your day-to-day -day production environment. So even though you get the product itself for free, ancillary services you pay for. Netscape's own website is a way that they can make money. www.netscape.com has many millions of hits a day, and they can make a lot of money off of banner ads. 
And finally, this may seem like a silly idea, they can make money off of logo products. They actually sell t-shirts, coffee mugs, and the like to people who are big fans of the Netscape company. So I think there's a, a good move here. What do you think, John? Oh, Rich, I think it's a, I think it's a great idea. Um, I, I think that uh, at some level there was a meeting in Netscape. This is sort of my guess when I first heard that. There's a meeting in Netscape, and they said, you know what? We have predicted we're going to lose to Internet Explorer in N years. What can we do that is the most annoying possible <laughs> thing to Microsoft? How can we annoy them more than anything else? And someone piped up, well, you guys are going to think this is a dumb idea, but how about if we give away source code? Yeah. Microsoft will never do that. And then someone looked around and said, you know, that might just be a good idea. And I, I think it might have been just something it like that, been. just cra a crazy offbeat idea. Let me mention a couple of places that folks can go to find out a little bit more about this. Okay. One, they might go and look at a column that I wrote on the subject at webreference.com. Look for the Internet Outlook column. And we have a conversation with Tim O'Reilly, who is the publisher of a forthcoming book that you're working yep. on. Another place you might look is for a paper called The Cathedral and the Bazaar, and it said along the lines of your speculation, this paper really influenced Netscape because it, it really makes the case for free software. Right. Well, folks, coming up next, we're going to go on the road. Join me on the road in San Francisco as I visit the offices of Worlds Incorporated, a company that builds virtual environments. Worlds has been in the business of what we consider creating cyberspace for a couple of years now. Our goal is to enable people, um, anyone connected to the internet, to, to use and to create multi-user virtual environments, three-dimensional environments that, that other people can access. That was our initial product, Worlds Chat. It went live on the internet last April, and it's been uh, very popular. It's principally a chat environment. You can go on, assume uh, a character or an avatar, as we call it, and go and interact with other people in the space. We've had probably a quarter of a million downloads in the last year, and we see three to 500 people in the space anytime, day or night actually have a service that's running almost like an introduction service or a dating service in, uh, in a six-story building in Tokyo that's a sort of combination cyber cafe, restaurant, singles bar. And people go to a virtual space in a real bar to meet people. That's correct. They, they take a, a laptop over to, uh, over to their table, they get into the virtual space, they meet someone, and they can decide right there, hey, I'd like to meet this person for real. I'd, I'd like to buy him a drink. This is the new version of chat, and as I understand it, the old version is quite popular with your staff. Yes. Um, this is the new version. It's got an extended avatar gallery, um, several, many more than before. We're going to have um, quite a few extended capabilities. For your identity remains constant because chat had this really interesting phenomenon in it before where, um, where identity was very fluid because every time you logged on, there was no reason for you to take the same avatar and username. So frequently people didn't. And it, it made for this very interesting environment where you just never knew what to expect and you never knew who anybody was and there was no reason for consistent identities. And that was interesting in and of itself. But this is going to be um, a lot more stable and community-oriented because you will have registered users with, um, with stable identities. This is the me avatar. Okay, well, we got to zoom in on this. <laughs> they wanted, um, yeah, we added several new ones, both photorealistic and, um, and animated, you know, drawn polygonal avatars. This is the hippie style with the flowered dress and Birkenstocks. Okay. We had a photo shoot where we took pictures of several people from our staff. And the way you do it is you have eight sides. We tend to use eight-sided avatars for photorealism. But we have a composer, actually, who's on staff at Worlds. He's very good. He's based in Los Angeles and has a very firm grasp of how to integrate electronic music and MIDI loops into a space and 
knit them together so that it feels like a, it is enhancing the experience. He's very good. And we've got a brilliant sound guy here in the production studio who added all the effects for all the doors and, and all the, and there's a cat in the garden space that meows and all kinds of things. There's an escalator sound. I, I really love the posters. These are hilarious. Travel zip, a guaranteed wit, air door travels. Why cryo freeze when you can air door breathe? Did you write some of these posters? I did not. I did not. These are posters written by uh, the artist who designed them. She's just wonderful. So this is Sky World. Um, it's yeah, it's beautiful. It's got pathways all over the place. You. This is a force field. This is kind of neat. you to another level. You could say this entire space could be used as a as a view space, chat space, anything you wish. And you can gaze off at the lip of infinity into the distance. Can I fly? You can't fly unfortunately. But the view is spectacular. This is, this is the courtyard entrance. You can hear the birds singing. You've got gates that squeak open, close behind you. Flowered walkways. Cherry blossoms on the trees. And these rooms are an interesting counterpoint. Sea anemone, it's call it what you will. It's the world's equivalent of a Rorschach test. Lily pond. If you look in, you can see the fish. There's a cat. Where's the cat? The cat's in the corner over here. You can see the cat. There's a frog, too. There's the cat. And if you click on it, you can give it to meow. We have bots that run around, but that's been sort of an interesting thing. There's Bots are very good for testing the software. You can program a bot to go to this place, that place, and see what it does, make sure it works, and the bots can talk. Make sure that make sure that all the text facilities work properly. So we use bots extensively for testing. Um, it's kind of an interesting phenomenon when you put a bot into a live chat session. People tend to go, "Run away! It's a bot!" They, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Eliza, which was a, it was a. Oh yeah, the, the yes. Yes, it was a, an ancient psychotherapy software yeah. program yeah. that tell me about your problems. So um, there was there are strong analogies between avatar bots in chat and the Eliza program and a certain amount of oh my god, what is that? It's 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 anthropomorphizing software. We can't do that. So there's a very strong sentiment toward I just want to use the technology to communicate with other people. Don't give me a bot. That's very interesting because obviously the world is virtual. Yes. But, and the objects are virtual, but they don't want virtual people. They don't want virtual people. Cyberspace is something that I'm quite passionate about seeing come alive and seeing built. And so this is, so it's very exciting to me to get the opportunity to sort of be here in this, in an organization that's working toward those goals. I want to get back to the topic that Rich was talking about, about Netscape source code. First thing that's on my mind is that why it's not the crown jewels for Netscape. Why aren't they going to go out of business? What do you think? Well, I, I think the point is that they're not making money on the Netscape Navigator today. Right. So anything they do is not potentially an improvement. Right, and I think that sort of one of the things that the Internet has taught us is that software itself, it's sort of the economics, the marginal cost of downloading one more thing is so low that the price has to be low. The valuable thing these days is support. Right. It's not the software. If I give you a piece of software with no support, you're not even going to waste time installing it. And we should be clear here, they're only giving away the basic Netscape Navigator. There are other components that go along with that that they're still charging for, and they're still selling corporate packages and licenses for, the, for these uh, enhanced... Right, and you brought up Linux as an example, and I think that's an excellent thing. One of the, one of the things I'm fond of saying is that the quality 
of the software that you purchased is inversely proportional to how much you pay. And the, and the key thing there is, is if I'm giving you something free, I can't hire a bunch of tech support people to fix it when it breaks. Well, that's one argument, and I've also heard the argument in the case of Linux that if you do find a bug um, and you post it to the news group, instead of having two or three support reps back in New York or whatever, you've got everybody on the planet who's interested in Linux looking at the problem. Right, and, and, and you know what I, I actually think is the biggest benefit to Netscape to this? The nothing that? that you mentioned at all? What's that? And that is, in a sense, the quality assurance process that their source code is going to go through. I think one of the fundamental problems of browsers is they're getting too complex. Yeah. I'm getting sick of browsers that are complex. They're going to have literally thousands of people from 14-year-olds in high school all the way up to going over that code line by line. And so the net result is they're going to get bugs. You mentioned bugs. They're going to get their source code improved for free. You sort of did say a little bit about that. But in terms of a downside, um, are we going to end up with one version of Netscape that the world contributes to, a dozen versions of Netscape, or a hundred versions of Netscape? Right. That's. I mean, like here I'm sitting at Michigan State University. Do I want to run my own version of Netscape with one little tiny change, or would I right. rather run download the, the binary? The real version of Netscape. Right. And, and, and so that's... And another potential downside that really concerns me is, what will this do to the HTML language itself? Microsoft and Netscape are competing with each other sort of as two giants struggling to add to the language. What if hundreds of people are now extending HTML? Right. And one of the things that I heard before uh, talking about one of the benefits of owning the, the dominant browser is you get to control the standards of what the web is. Right. By putting it in your browser, you put in 56 high fonts and bingo, everybody starts using it and you have then defined the standard. And so at some point, if Netscape can control the browser standard by giving away what were the crown jewels, they might have won the bigger battle. But it could fall either way. It could become a world where HTML goes back to an open and universally accepted standards process. Or it could be the case that Chuck likes the Chuck tag, right. and you invent that for your version of Netscape, and nobody else looking at your document is able to read what the Chuck tag but does. I, but I don't think that'll happen. I really don't think that'll happen, because if I make pages, it's sort of a PR expression of me, and I want people to see it. And if right. those that don't have the Chuck tag, I mean, I won't use things that won't work both on Netscape and Internet Explorer. I mean, right. you know, I, I don't want a bunch of diversity on my pages. Right. Now that, there might be some special applications where that would be the case. It's going to be very interesting to watch. Coming up next, we're going to visit Net News, and perhaps we're going to have some time to do some surfing. Now let's see what's happening in the news of the net. Netscape may be looking for someone to buy them out. Analysts claim that Netscape has had discussions with Sun, America Online, IBM, and others. It may be that they simply can't compete with Microsoft as a standalone entity. The Clinton administration has proposed a plan for new top-level domains. Their green paper outlines a scheme where we will make a transition from the current company, Network Solutions Incorporated, to a new multi-company environment. Some existing American firms in this business and many European authorities aren't happy with the administration scheme. Microsoft is trying to move its browser staff into their general Windows development unit. The browser business group is now part of the Windows unit, and this could raise some attention from the U.S. Justice Department. Analysts, however, think it's a good move. AT&T has slashed its workforce and is going to move into Internet telephony. 14% of the workforce, or 18,000 workers, are without jobs. But at the same time, AT&T says they can make money offering IP telephony. Media One is lay laying a lot of fiber in Los Angeles. They're going to build a high-speed fiber optic ring around the city. They will serve companies such as the entertainment industry and the aerospace industry, providing channels as fast as 622 megabits per second over broadband. What do you think of that, Chuck? Well, I think that last story is a very interesting story. Um, it, it sort of 
my theory is is that the internet, as we sort of saw the internet for many years, was really a prototype of sort of this new digital communication infrastructure. And I think you know having widespread 622 megabits, I think will push that envelope even farther. I think it's uh, very interesting. But but all those stories were interesting. I could I could talk for a long time about each one of those and and argue. It we'll bums me out. We'll bums me out about that domain we'll name thing. It really does. Does it really? It just. Uh, we'll have to pontificate on that in a we'll future. We'll have to pontificate episode. later. But what, what, you got a really hot site. A couple. Before of people we close, I want to show an example of a site that uses a little bit of bandwidth in a very interesting and exciting way, and this is sort of like curling. Either you like it a lot or you don't understand it at all and you hate it. So let's take a look at it. This is a place called Gabo Corp. Okay. And this was created by somebody in Puerto Rico, as it happens. And they're using Shockwave and Shockwave Flash and a little bit of Java to do some fancy stuff. The user interface, as you'll see, is a little bit more exciting than your typical web page. And we'll pick on one of these items off of the main menu here. And look at how the elements swirl around on screen. Well, and they're, they're doing it rather quickly, too. That's That, I think, is a key thing. And part of that is something that you could only do if you had the latest advances of Flash. Now, my understanding is what Flash is, is it's, it's a streaming animation. These are not like video here that we're watching. This is actually like move the ball to the left kind of like, like well, thing. Well, yeah, there's like you download the object once and then you send commands as to what to do with the object and in a way that's sort of analogous to what goes on with World's Chat right. which we saw earlier. Because they're not sending those faces over the net every time they're just sending a little thing saying where the face is supposed to be. And the audio as you can hear is kind of exciting but it's a loop so that comes down once and then it plays the loop so that doesn't cost a lot of bandwidth either. One thing I've noticed about it looking at this site is what's funny is a lot of these menus are very like gopher menus we have very rich annotation I'm sorry very, very rich animation and very little annotation look at how short these phrases are right so you have to drive through the experience in order to figure out where you're really going now and I don't know what is that a good thing I don't know I, well I, uh, you what would you say the purpose of this is well these people do this kind of design for a living so first off the purpose is to get you excited and go we want to hire these people to do our design well an undergraduate student came into my office this afternoon and pointed this site out to me and told me a little bit, and I don't know if it's true or not, about the person who set it up. I think she said that it was a young man in Puerto Rico who's been doing graphic design from the time he's five years old, just like graphic design geek. And to me, this is amazing that a, a guy from Puerto Rico can pop up like this and word can spread like wildfire. I mean, you wrote about it in your column. This guy could become wealthy from Puerto Rico. I think it's wonderful. I think it's amazing. One, one of the first really exciting websites was Honolulu Community College, and they smoked MIT and AT&T and everybody else. The same thing's going on now in 1998. Right. As a, a fellow in Puerto Rico shows everybody how it ought to be done. Well, gee whiz, I, we're just about out of time, but that is a really nice, nice website. We'll look at them more in the future. So we'll see you on the net. <laughs>